Okay, and welcome to the Athletic Development Show, proudly brought to you by Iron Edge. Uh, today's guest is uh, one of the um, best strength and conditioning athletic development coaches this country's ever produced. I am <laughs> out of my tree with excitement to have him here. Uh, Lockie Wilmot, uh, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for the introduction, mate. I think you're the only one that will say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, just in, in, the, in the incredibly rare scenario that you don't know who Lockie is and you're in this space, uh, Lockie has worked in the AFL system with GWS. He's um, been a, a high performance manager at the Parramatta Eels. Um, he's uh, now an ASCA board member, which I think is awesome to have a, a private industry representative person on, on the board there. Um, and he is the co-owner and director of coaching at Athletes Authority, who are one of the best companies, I believe, in the world in this space. And they are on a trajectory that's amazing to be able to watch. And he's also the host of a brilliant podcast, uh, Athletes Authority On Air, which is um, a must listen. If you're not listening to that and you're in our field, then you're probably on your way out of the field. You're clearly not interested. <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> Jeez, one of the best intros I've ever had, mate. I'll do this any time. <laughs> right. I, look, I, I love your work, Lockie, and I'm so excited to be able to chat to you. There's, there's so much to, to talk about. Um, I wouldn't mind diving in first. A uh, bit of a, bit of a um, it's not a tangent, but a bit of a confession, I suppose, from me. Probably every second post of yours, at least, I look at and I get really pissed off because I'm like, oh, that's what I think. I should have said that. <laughs> <laughs> we, it's really interesting how much and i love that mike Boyle quote in the beginner's mind there are many uh choices in the experts there are a few like you do come to certain conclusions based on you know logic yeah uh, i'm really in and and listening to your origins podcast was great because i didn't realize how much we had in common in terms of the people we followed early on mm. but i'm really curious to hear about the giants whose shoulders you have stood on because you've come across you've had great who luck i love the jim collins term who luck mm. you've come across some great people i'd love to hear about who they are and how they've influenced you yeah look i i think um i probably had a bit of an inverse transition into our our fitness industry um i think a, a lot of people start with the the bodybuilding days uh, they jump into that they love the bodybuilding um they then progress steadily more and more holistic till when they're a, a very senior coach they're much more holistic and, and open with everything um i probably jumped around I, I definitely got in the the bodybuilding side of things when i was young coming through the personal training ranks but very quickly got skewed because of people like paul check um and charles poliquin when when we started to look at the holistic approach to training mm. and paul check if you know who paul check is um you know he's a, a big proponent of a lot of the the holistic side of things um and that was the the route i went down very quickly in my career the 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 eating well sleeping well nutritionally balanced type of side of things that the the so-called functional training and, and this type of era where it sort of hit me quite quickly and it's probably if anything made me naturally gravitate to a lot of different books a lot of different sources for information um even though paul check certainly had a monopoly of information information at a, at a stage there where people sort of believed everything he said um but he, he went to full guru mode didn't he, he, was didn't he? yeah I'll yeah forget early on um one of the things i was loving him but one of the things that turned me off uh, a bit later in the piece was he started to quote himself in his own writings he'd be like blah 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 paul check brackets yes <laughs> like, yes which which funnily enough a few people out there still do they uh, they quote themselves <laughs> uh, uh dr joel seedman being one loves to quote himself <laughs> on a few things um but yeah so it, it, if, it, if it did anything it did show the amount of mm. um amount of sources that he got his information from because he was very much mm. about saying i didn't go to university um i i'm self-educated and stuff like that and um i think that was That's a really Really good it? process for me to be able to um, to understand that, that there's not one way of doing things, there's multiple ways of doing it. And, and mm. they were probably the early starters. And then, like you mentioned before, Mike Boyle was a big influence because of um, what he was putting out. And, and naturally, being in Australia, um, US coaches, anyone like that that's putting information out, um, is going to, it's going to, if it's easy to get, because this is before social media, if it's easy to get, whether that be VCR or DVD, um, it's going to be more um, palatable to another coach. And that was where I was at. I was at a stage where I wanted to learn more. I wanted to sit down and watch videos and watch DVDs around, um, you know, training. And again, this was before it was big on YouTube and anything like that. So um, it was a natural gravitation to these coaches that were 
at the forefront of, of educational material. Um, and that was sort of my early days. Did you read his book first or straight to the DVD? No, I actually read functional, uh, I, I watched his functional strength coach yeah, series cool. first, learned that. about his book and then got his book after that. Yeah. yeah, I stumbled across it. I was just in Borders one day, which is a now defunct bookshop. Mm, yeah, yeah. And I, um, I used to go there and sit and just uh, read and kind of hang out there and drink coffees. Uh, and I stumbled across his book in 2004. Yeah. And yeah, it just changed my life. I was like, this is it, just ridiculous. And, yeah, and, um, and, and to be honest, it was very similar. You know, the first book I ever read um, in this industry was um, a, a book uh, a long time ago now that was um, – it, it's – it's a bodybuilding book and it was something that was typically not something I'd probably read now, but it was the, I got it for Christmas and it was basically your, your 12 week sort of body challenge. And, um, mm. and I read that cover to cover in about was two it, days. Was it body for life? Yes, correct. Ah, body for yeah. life, Bill, Bill Phillips. Bill Phillips, yeah. Yes. Um, and that was, and in high school, I did not, I hated reading, hated it. Um, I think I managed to get through high school without reading a single book completely. <laughs> I managed to do the half, half ass way of doing it, the cliff notes and everything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, when, when I read that, there was sort of that was my turning point where I went, well, you know what, there, awesome. there, there must be something to this and, and, yeah. um, and followed from there. Um, but ultimately, that was sort of the, the people that influenced me from a distance. And then mm. um, going through the process of, of, uh, of my undergraduate degree, moving into more professional settings, um, probably the two biggest influences for me were two of my managers, one being John Quinn, um, who was my first uh, performance manager Which through is the Giants. Pod. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. So for those that don't know, he was at Essendon for 10 years, he's an Olympic uh, track and field coach. Um, and he was the one that really taught me the, the benefit of, of making an athlete athletic, not mm. just getting them strong, not just doing X, Y and Z, but, but actually having an athlete be athletic. Um, mm. And that's where a lot of the, 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 the concepts around contrast training and plyometrics and all this integration that I love doing now um, really came from. And he was very, he was a very coach coach. So he was very coach dominant. Um, probably had a bit of a, a feel around the fact that physio shouldn't be on the gym floor and stuff like that. So a little bit of an older mentality in mm -hmm. that sense. Um, and it was really good for me at the time. And then um, when he moved on and, and David Joyce was my next manager, um, and for those in our industry know David's a, a fairly um, you know, a significant figure in our mm -hmm. industry with a lot of things. And he was sort of the other contrast side where he was, the, he was a physio turned S&C, so to speak, um, and, and was very integrated in everything he did and, and taught me a lot about how physios integrate with strength and conditioning, how performance model acts as a whole rather than silos. And um, I think that, again, was just that next string to the bow that, that, that I had this whole side of making an athlete athletic and I developed a lot of systems around that and then shifted that across to, well, the fact that an athlete is always about to get injured or are injured that yeah. not having an integration of physio is just insane. So to start mm -hmm. to understand that flow and, again, working with great physios at the Giants um, who understood that, who understood that, that lifting and being strong was a good solution to injuries um, was, was a massive benefit to me and, and the way my systems evolved over time. That's huge. What ama it's, it's amazing how much luck can feature into things. Like what, what a, an amazing like, sequence. Like if you'd, gone, if you'd run into them in the opposite <laughs> sequence, it probably wouldn't have been as good. Like mm. Oh, 100%. Yeah, people, yeah. But it's the right order, isn't it? Yeah, no, I completely yeah. agree. No, spot on. That's, that's great. They're, they're huge. Um, so uh, I'm curious, you know, we're talking about, about Paul Check and, um, and, and the others. Um, you seem to me to have done a very good job of being agnostic of not, you know, there's some people, it's like they, um, someone is almost like a, they become a disciple of a certain person. Mm. And I've always thought the best thing is to kind of get a bit from here, a bit from there, and you know, put your own approach together. As a young coach, it would have been quite um, uh, easy to get sucked into thinking that certain people were the, the bill and end all. Mm. Did, were you just naturally sceptical, or did you, or did you get sucked in a bit when you were younger and go, you know, and jump the shark? Yeah, look, to be honest, um, I definitely think when I was really young, I got. I got sucked into a, for example, Paul Check was someone that was easy to gravitate to. Mm. The benefit of him at the time was he was quite holistic, as I mentioned. So mm. um, I, I certainly think I've always been the type of person that that didn't tend to just follow one person. I certainly had um, role models and idols and stuff like that, but I was, I've, I've always been in the strength conditioning industry of the mentality that, that, 
they're all tools in a toolbox. And to be honest, mm. um, you know, I, I joke around about the toolbox. We had um, at university, we had a, a subject where we had to create a coach's toolbox. And I heard the term yeah. toolbox so many bloody times. <laughs> every time I say it now, I almost cringe in my own head um, at the analogy of it. But but it is true. And, and the, it is, exactly. And, and for me, it's, it's always the mentality I've had. I've never understood people that are, I'm a kettlebell guy or I'm mm. a functional guy. It's just, well, I, to me, I just, I just use whatever's going to get me the result. Um, and something that I've always said with, with both um, methods and tools is that everyone gets results. That's the, that's the hardest thing about our injury, even uh, in industry, not injury, um, even the, the most just Muppet based people that, you know, they have had a result with somewhere, someone at some time mm. that is, that has resulted in them believing so wholeheartedly in their method or their, their design. Um, so there's always going to be context where you can see where something would work or how something would work. Um, so I, I, I do believe that they're like every method can have a place to an extent. Um, and every tool can have a place to an extent. Uh, there's certainly some tools that are far more risky than others. Um, that that I, I typically may not use on a risk reward basis, and same with methods. Um, but it's it's just one of those things. I find it so much easier to be a coach that can move around to anything I need, rather than um, indoctrinated into to one methodology or, or one principle and not flow around. It's just crazy, and it's like it's like if you're a tradie and you had to sign up, and you were like, I, I'm an electrician, and I am only going to use, you know, I mean, I think Mike boy gives example a chainsaw, or I'm mm. only going to, it's like. You want yeah. to be able to change it, will like pick, and that's the tool, the know? common saying, isn't it? When when all you've got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, and yeah. it is the the same principle in strength conditioning. When when your only methodology in history is around, say, getting strong, then mm. then you believe everything is a weakness, um, mm. rather than you know integrating could be you know, explosive power, could be change direct, all these sorts of things into it. Um, and not to say strength doesn't doesn't help along the, the way, but it's um, it, it'd be very hard as a coach to go along your life like that. I think it's interesting. Our industry is often so many people uh, in the space do have a really significant strength background. And I remember talking to a, a coach once, and the question came up of how strong is strong enough? Like you're never strong enough. I'm like I don't reckon I agree. I think once you're a little past. I mean, Matt Barr put it really well once. Um, if you're a little bit to the right of where the law of diminishing returns flattens out, that's probably a good spot to be. Like, the, you're not going to yeah. be a better athlete. If you've got someone squatting 140, they're not going to be a better athlete squatting 300 um, but, kilos, necessarily. My response to that would be, I don't think you can be strong enough within your constraints of time. So, that's, for example, yeah, if I'm a, if I'm a rugby program. league if I'm a rugby league player, mm. I, I need to be doing rugby league. Like I, I need to be learning rugby league. I need to be a PhD in my sport. Now, mm. if I have allocated to me three one-hour lifts a week um, and that's what I'm going to do, if I need to get better at kicking, maybe I eliminate one of those lifts, in which case I have two lifts a week. But if I, if I just rest, I'm always going to try and get my athletes stronger within mm. those two lifts. But I'm not going to go to someone that's squatting two times body weight. We need to add another session to get to three times because mm. you're never strong enough. Because you are strong enough. There's certain, there's plenty of examples where you're strong enough. But within the constraints of time, I certainly believe I'm always going to chase. And, and that's the mentality I have with my older athletes as well. I work with many older athletes when it comes to AFL and things like that, where they're at a stage where they're not, they don't necessarily need to chase to get stronger. But that doesn't mean the mentality of the two sessions that they do that week is not going to be get stronger yeah, but i'm certain yeah. exactly but i'm certainly not going to hit four weeks of one rms hoping to try and <laughs> pb them by two and a half kilos because it's again it's just not within the constraints of the the time that you allocated yeah couldn't agree more now um an area where we're very different uh is that you have an olympic level bias to action i i uh, i'll tend to overthink things and you know <laughs> six months or six years later i'm still talking about a thing and you were just like in there six minutes later uh, I love the story of how you, you discovered that strength and conditioning coaching was an industry and you went from basically discovering that to discovering you needed a degree to enrolling in the degree pretty much in a 24-hour period. Yes. Yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, I did, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, I was... <laughs> 
It was, uh, yeah, no, I was, um, as I said, I was, I was offered a strength conditioning role within the New South Wales AFL Academy when I was a, a personal trainer after a series of, of different events. And um, yeah, that, that night I, I sort of found out that, yeah, you know, actually this could be a career that uh, you can get paid full time. And um, yeah, it just so happened that it was around the intake time for ACU at the time. So I, I sort of was looking at, oh, could I do a certificate in, um, I believe it was so an advanced diploma in fitness that would then account for the first year of, uh, of an ACU undergraduate. Mm. Um, and then I realised, hang on, I might as well just apply straight to uni because I reckon I can get in with with my marks, uh, experience and the fact that it's the perfect timing. And um, yeah, put it in. And then the next week later, I was uh, I was suddenly put into it. And uh, next Great. next thing, I was uh, enrolled in a degree and off I go. So, I um, and I, I sort of said that at the time, it was one of those things where when you're, um, when you're an old, older, older coach, and uh, at that time I was 20, 21 going into uni, definitely not old, but old for starting uni. Um, I think they even call you mature age at that time. Um, mm. But it allowed me to have such such more uh, targeted perception and, and aggression towards what I wanted mm. that I, I kind of felt like I got a lot more out of university than a lot of the 18-year-old counterparts oh, that God. were there where they sort of still were unsure of what they wanted to do. They'd never done personal training. Like for me, having been a personal trainer for four years prior, I, I knew the weaknesses. I knew what people understood and what they didn't. And especially in the resistance training units, when we'll talk about coaching and, and, and some of the people would talk about, you know, how they would coach something and they're standing there so robotic, do this, <laughs> then this. And you're like, that would, that would never happen, never, never happen. Never happen. So um, yeah. things like that are, are things that I think are, are really advantageous to be able to, to be a mature age student. You know, that's huge because one of the biggest challenges we have here at Core Advantage is we have to unteach our interns how to, they, they come in and they're like standing there, now proceed to do the squat movement, like, and they give you 17 different cues, yeah. and we've got to unteach that. Whereas you didn't have to unteach any of that because you just, as soon as it was happening, you're like, no, that's just not how the real world works. Yeah. Oh, and I, I remember one of them was a, was a deadlift and I said, have you ever done a deadlift before? And the person said, yes, I have. And I said, great, can you please show it to me? And then they deadlifted three times and I said, absolutely nothing. And one of the other people said, oh, no, you need, you need to cue it. And I said, cue what? And they said, cue the deadlift. I said, but the deadlift's perfect. Why would I cue anything? Yeah, and they're like, yeah. oh, and that was the discussion. And I'm like, yeah. well, I, I don't see why I would be throwing cues out when, when I don't need to cue anything. And I think that's a, a classic thing with young coaches now that mm. the, the over cueing and the over coaching because they feel like they should be doing something. And, mm. and we've all been there. You're standing there and you're like, oh, I should do something. I should feel and make myself feel worthy. But realistically, if it's a, if it's a great it's deadlift, great. Just, let the, just let them do it. Yeah, Good job just, carry on. give them a pat on the bum and say, fantastic work. <laughs> now, now, the heart of that question was, hold on, this has been great to chat about that part of it. What I want to get at is that I don't think that that bias to action was alone in that particular example. I suspect that's a, that's a locky thing. Where did you get that from, do you think? Because we're all on a continuum. Um, uh, is it, was it your dad? Was it uh, your Yeah, I, to, to be honest, I, I don't think it's something that I naturally, I, I – I probably be the, I, I hate I hate people that talk and don't act. So that's probably the underlying mm, okay. thing. I, I, yeah. I hate the discussions that go around and around, and we experience it all the time, especially in discussions um, in a pro setting where there's always talk, always talk, mm. and no action. So that that's an underlying frustration for me. But by the same token, I'm also a bit of a, a perfectionist when it comes to things. So I actually, I probably like things being really perfect before I, I actually release or talk about anything or do anything. Um, and that's where my business partner, Carl's probably helped me a lot more. He's, he's far more um, sporadic and random in the nature of just getting things out and, and actioning things even if they're not perfect and then adapting. And it's something that I've probably taken on board. There's a, there's a number of things that I would have probably not done straight away until I had have gotten it perfect. Mm. Um, but because of Carl, we've gone up, we've, we've got a date, we want to get it out, we want to do it and we push it out. Um, and it's not perfect, but we start to, to yeah. sharpen it around the edges as we go. Um, and so I think like my, my mother, my father are both sort of, sort of action people uh mm. the old man runs he's an engineer and runs a company mm. and and my uh, my mother is she was a, a personal trainer slash aerobics instructor she right. is very stubborn very loud very <laughs> actioned so so potentially i could that's, have gotten it from there not sure but, the engineer and the and the, and the, the fitness trainer yes yeah very very yeah dad's very much the uh the first fleet general like and mum's very much <laughs> the first fleet convict um so to, together they combine quite well that's amazing <laughs> Um, and what kind of an engineer is your dad? 
Uh, I'm a civil engineer. Civil engineer, yeah. It's interesting. So my wife's an aerospace engineer. Oh, yeah, um, it is. Um, and we, and I think the, if you're around people in engineering, I do think it influences you as a coach. I think, I don't know, there's just something where you start to think about the body more as that intersection of kind of physics, mm. physiology, and engineering. I think it's... it's yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, there's, there's a lot of industries out there that complement our industry substantially. Mm, and mm. Uh, we, we were talking about books beforehand that I think yeah. uh, too many people get caught up in reading just the, the S&C books rather mm. than branching out and looking. You know, me personally, I don't like novels and stuff. I still, I still can't read them. Mm. Um, I'm still a movie buff and I always will be. Yeah. But um, I do love reading um, you know, self-development books on a whole different um, you know, space and area and stuff like that what are some of your favorites um one of my favorites in that area would be black box thinking um i think okay. that's a fantastic book it's I a read that yeah it's a it's a it's a great one around the the um the reversal of your fear of failure and talking about okay. how to actually maximize the learnings from failure and i think it probably actually ties in really nicely to to talk about before where i used to be a bit of a perfectionist mm. before pushing things out that um that you know the concept of the black box that when there's a crash you analyze the black box mm -hmm. and you fix um that, that that should be happening in day-to-day -day life as well when when you fail analyze what you're doing reset and, and make a better and more improved option and um you know that's the, the iteration of everything um you know there's a there's a there's a great quote in friends i'm a big friends buff that um yeah. that uh <laughs> when when uh they were talking about a, a computer program that was i can't i guess you can't remember the computer program now something something 2000 um and he talks about you know there there was the the one the two three four all the way up to 2000 and and said that you know i learned you know one 1,999 ways how not to make a software. And um, <laughs> I think it's a fantastic analogy that, yeah. that everything you see out there publicly that you think works really well, um, you know, one of the biggest things that we do here is the way we, we systemize a lot of our programming and it's it's worked really well and works really well with our environment, but um, we've learned hundreds of ways not to do it, um, mm. which ultimately gets us to, to where we are. I, I, I want to dive into the system a bit later because I, I absolutely love it. It's very, very clever um yeah it's, it's great um so the other thing i want to ask you about uh and i loved your saying you seem incredibly productive and i, I heard you saying the other day on the podcast um what was it um don't stay up for something you wouldn't or not you're saying you said someone else <laughs> with it but don't yes. stay up for something you wouldn't get up for, which I think yes. is a great now, thing I, to live by. Now, I feel terrible because I actually cannot remember who said that. And there was a, a, um, a dietitian, I believe, or a recovery expert from the RAS. Now, I can't remember who it was, but she um, she was quoted in one of our things at the Giants we had that um, basically said, yeah, don't, don't, don't uh, stay awake for anything that you wouldn't get up for. Um, and it's a great name. Like if, great. if, you yeah. get, if you're going to watch another episode, would you actually get up early to watch that episode? And 99% mm. of people would, would not do that so i think it's a it's a great way to have um great. it is ironic because I, i'm actually a terrible sleeper um i do stay up late <laughs> um I've, i i get up early every day while well, i've got a newborn now so i get up mm. even earlier but um for work uh, you know for 15 years now i've been getting up anywhere between 4 30 to 6 a.m and um still if you were to not if i was not to set an alarm i would probably wake up at 10 a.m um, I still, I still naturally have. Everyone says, "Oh, you get used to it," um, and don't get me wrong, I, I'm used to it. But I certainly haven't learned how to to get up early. Um, I, I naturally, my my ideal would be probably in bed about one a.m. and get up about nine. Um, yeah, right. That would be the ideal. But um, but alas, <laughs> that's not the the world <laughs> we live in. <laughs> Um, and uh, so, what's your daily routine like? Uh, I'm curious to how how you structure things. Yeah. So um, look, we it's. I get up any uh, at the moment. I've got a newborn, so as I said sometimes oh, I'm up at four thirty. Uh, she's six months; just turned six months. So, okay, so um, that yeah, she's going. Yep, she's still still doing things. But um, look, I'll get up anywhere between five and six a.m. Um, and aim to. Uh, I'm lucky enough that I'm quite close. Um, I know so many people in in our industry and. Um, it's almost a badge of honor these days. People say, I, I take a cold shower, I journal for half an hour, I do meditation for 20 minutes. I then, right, like things that they do, it's, it's just, you know, the Tim Ferriss morning sounds yeah. like it takes about four hours. And, yeah. um, I'm a big believer in uh, having key things that I know no matter how busy I get, um, I will always be able to do. Um, and the two biggest things for that is before I go to bed, I'll write out all my to-dos in an app that I have. Um, and then I use? take... Um, it's called To Do. Um, yep. So it's Todoist, I believe, actually, yep. Todoist. 
Um, and that then I then take all the to-dos for the next day and I put them into my, again, just my Apple calendar um, mm-hmm. and I map out and I book in blocks of time for my whole day. So my whole day mm-hmm. is full, filled every minute when I'm having breakfast, lunch, everything like that. Um, even if I don't completely stick to it, it gives me an action plan. And, and that is literally the two things that I do to, to solidify um, my, my routine. Um, yeah. So if I can, I know I can do that because it only takes... 10 minutes and I do it in bed. I know people say don't use your phone in bed, but um, that's that's what I do. That's how I, I let my brain um, get everything out um, mm. and be able to relax. And so then in the morning, I, I simply, look, I get up, I pack my bar, shower, pack my bag, get out the door. I walk to work, takes about 10 minutes. Um, on the way, I sit down at a park bench halfway and I do 10 minutes of meditation. Now, that's the ideal. Sometimes uh, if uh, if my daughter's uh, been a bit annoying in the morning and I'm, I'm late, then um, then I won't do that. But if I've got time, I will. Um, and then from there, roll in and, and from about sort of anywhere between 6.30 and 7 a.m., I, I'm in the in the facility till about you know 6 p.m. Um, mm-hmm. And the, each day is a little bit different. Obviously, we're in we're in lockdown at the moment, mm-hmm. um, so my coaching is almost zero um, at the moment because of my coaches. Um, we've got we're keeping all of our coaches on, so we've got a number of full time coaches. Um, so they're supervising in pairs training outdoors. Um, so unfortunately, we're doing very little coaching because if we coach, we're then a third person in a in an environment that now is no longer COVID compliant. Um, so we prioritize having two athletes in that outdoor space so we stand back from a distance and help where we where we can but ultimately very little coaching um, but it is something that I've tried to focus on both myself and Carl over the past sort of six months to to develop a really strong staff where we can step away from the the day to day almost um, and start to work on those higher pieces, which which ultimately hopefully the public can start to see now around a lot of the podcast work, the courses mm-hmm. we're going to be running and stuff like that, um, which is something we've we've slowly evolved and we really had a philosophy of, of nailing everything in our four walls, um, and that was a lot of coaching hours over the past two years. You know, coming out of pro sport. Um, cut, jumping straight onto the floor here, and I was yeah, we were sort of coaching from six six a.m. to seven p.m. most days consistently um, when we didn't have days. a lot of staff. Oh, very long, very long days. Um, and and then we started to add more and more staff. Our systems got better. Our staff understood our systems more, and there was more opportunity for us to be able to step back and um, and be able to work on those those bigger picture things. But um, but once we're out of COVID, um, I certainly look forward to at least getting back on the floor and running around and yelling a little yeah. bit. <laughs> I miss coaching. I, uh, th- yeah. it is, it, it's, it'll be nice to get back and actually be able to be there, there on the gym floor again. I couldn't agree. Oh, 100%. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really heartbreaking. <laughs> um, last question on this section. Uh, your thinking skills, your logical skills, um, for me, I stumbled across. I did it in my undergraduate degree. I did a course in political philosophy, and there was a there was a book with a chapter on logic, and that one chapter changed the course of my life because I realised yeah. just how little there was. I started to see the whole world. I'm like, oh, almost none of this is logical. Like this yeah. is just we do it cause yeah, there was so much of, of that. Um, when I in in your work, I see a rigorous um, sort of vein of of logic. Like it's always well constructed. The, the, the foundation thinking is always really good. Where did you get that? And you don't get taught that in a sports science degree. Was that from your mentors or was that from another source that you got good at that? Um, it's it's probably an almost unanswerable question. I'm not sure where it came from or how it evolved. It, it's probably, um, for me, I've always liked routine. Um, mm-hmm. For me, routine, then the solution to good routine is typically good systems, um, mm-hmm. a good system application. Um, and there's there's going to be that that mentality of people that say we're in a chaotic environment um, and it's unpredictable, and it 100% is. Um, but within that chaos, there's always things that repeat. There's always scenarios that are similar. Um, and I think even amongst chaos, the 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 solution of saying it's chaotic therefore i will not try and systemize it yeah. is probably what makes things more chaotic um and the inverse is true where when you try and completely systemize chaos you're always going to be pulling your hair out um mm. if you've got any um because <laughs> of the 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 just the rampant nature of what chaos brings um, so I think that's where the evolution of the way I, I tend to think is the, the systemized approach to pretty much everything where if you can systemize 80% of it, it gives you the energy to deal with the 20% chaos. And 
And I really believe that that occurs in our industry and in life in general, that mm. if, you're, if you're rolling around with 80% of your, your day, 80% of your, um, your coaching, your programming, everything like that, systemized where it's the ability for you to understand that this has happened before and this is how I respond, um, makes it so much easier to take on that 20% of, of pure chaos. Yeah. Um, and people that get burnt out in our industry, people that uh, that get emotionally, mentally tired, uh, are ones that are have so many decisions every day. Mm. Um, and people talk about decision fatigue, and always use the Steve Jobs example where he mm. wears the same shirt every day to stop a decision. Now, look, I don't know if that's really true. I don't know if that's truly why he did it. Um, no one does know. It just is obviously good for a book. Um, but the, the same principle still applies to me. It's not. I don't get decision fatigue from choosing a uniform as much as I enjoy wearing the same thing every day. Um, it is certainly true when it comes to programming, to um, to, to testing results, to, to structures and everything like that, that, that if you're trying to reinvent the wheel every single day, it is so exhausting and it becomes such a big task versus mm. when you, you've taken care of 80% of those issues, you then have this energy to be able to work on 20%. And, and any personal trainer, any coach will be able to tell you that of their, their athlete list, whether it's team, individual, doesn't matter, that 80% of your time goes into 20% of that list because 80% mm. of your list is actually most of the time pretty easy to program for. Um, they're not injured. Uh, they like the, the usual things. They fit into certain boxes. But then you've got those 20% that you always have to edit so many things, rebuild things, change things. But if you're building new programs, for as, as an example, for every athlete all the time, when you get to your, your problematic 20%, you're already so exhausted that, that you're not it's really right. given the application yeah. you need. Um, that's the perfect segue into what I, I wanted to ask you about, which is uh, where you're at now. Because I, th I think, I hope you don't mind uh, talking about it again, but I think okay. your system is, uh, is brilliant. Um, and I'd love to, for our audience to hear you explain that. I think it's just absolutely great that from the base programming through to the testing yep. um, and yep. your five-week thing, I think it's all fascinating. Yeah, look, it's it's something that's evolved over time, and it'll continue to evolve as as we we um, we sharpen the sword a bit. But um, it sort of evolved from what I used to do in a team setting. Um, you know, you've got fifty athletes that you need to be able to to again systemize, be accountable for, and make good progress. But it also takes into account that people probably over individualize a lot of team sport and a lot of group settings. Um, and ultimately, it ruins the culture and ruins the feel. Um, pe people always talk about bringing good culture, building good culture and everything like that. And, and I, I firmly believe you can't implement um, a culture-driven um, option. There, there's nothing that you can just be like, well, this is something I'm going to add for culture. Uh, mm -hmm. Culture comes from everything else and the way you do everything at the facility. Um, one of our old coaches, Scott, Scott used to say, uh, culture is what it is. And, and it is very true. It's, it's, it's very hard to manipulate. I, I firmly believe the way you, you program um, then affects the way people flow on the gym floor and therefore affects your culture quite a lot. Mm. And what I mean by that is when, when I first came on board, rightly or wrong, we had, we had a number of coaches on board that was very hard for me to implement systems when I wasn't there. I was, I was still at Parramatta or the Giants at the time, um, and it was more secondhand trying to, let's try and do this. Can we try and do this? But I wasn't on the gym floor. I wasn't able to see first hand what needed to be done as much um, so we gave them a little bit more rain so we we had sort of two dominant senior coaches and you could walk in there and straight away pick out whose program is which um, every athlete was very individualized so much so that they all had their heads in their phones on team builder doing their session everyone had a different exercise they're all going about their business trying to trying to get things done now that's not saying the programs weren't good nor were they productive because they certainly were the, the athletes got results they, they they did what they needed to do but the culture of the gym just wasn't there. It, there was there was so many athletes that didn't even know the name of people that they, they would commonly train with at the same mm. time. Um, so it was something that, one, we needed to cut down and systemise the way programming done because it was just fatiguing uh, on the coach and just wasn't scalable. Um, but we also needed to, to build a bit more of an integrated culture with the way we, we, uh, we program to allow athletes to work together. So we brought in a bit of similarity. So the way we sort of did it is we, we systemised in phases. So... Uh, phase one is we built out what we term our base programs. Um, our base programs are grouped based on what field or surface they play on. So we have a field-based program, um, and that is anyone that competes on grass or turf. Uh, so that's cricket, 
baseball all the way through to soccer, rugby, AFL. Uh, we then have our court-based programs, which are people like basketballers, um, volleyballers, and then you know tennis players and things like that. Hard surface is much more predictable. Um, we then have our track-based program, which is all for our track and field uh, teams. Um, we then have our combat, uh, which is, as it sounds, all of our combative sports that are a little bit more 360 and unique. And then our final one, which is water, snow and ice, which is effectively there's no common surface that they put force into. Mm. So that allows us to make our first groupings and we build those five base programs and then they get deposited across all of our athletes. From that, each of our individual coaches will then individualize according to our systematic breakdown and the individual athlete. So the first thing they look at is, okay, where are they at with their plyometrics? So we adjust their plyometric stages and phases and allow them to be specific to where they are in their progressions. The next one we then look at is how do we then adapt it to the sport itself? So when it comes to the sport, they're each going to have what we term extension. So, for example, on a field-based program, we might look at cricket. Um, it might be a fast bowler. Therefore, there's going to be a rotational extension. There's going to be a, a, an upper limb extension, shoulder extension. So these are the things that we can look at and go, okay, um, we need to add these extensions in. So they have specific lots where they can pull exercises out and replace them with these specific extensions. The next one we then look at is injury history and the sport in relationship to resilience programming. So what injuries have they had previously? What injuries could they get from the sport? And that's what governs a lot of their resilience exercises. So again, within our breakdown, we can have allotted spots where our coaches will pull exercises out, then replace them with these specific resilience exercises. Mm -hmm. And finally, dislikes and likes of the individual athlete um, and anything that we know that they want to respond to. And from that, we now have these big key lifts that ultimately will be quite common amongst field-based sports. So if you're a rugby player, soccer player, you might all be doing an A1 where you're doing a trap bar deadlift. Mm. And guess what? That, that doesn't mean that these athletes go, oh, they're doing the same program. It suddenly means, oh, hey, my name's Lachlan. Can I lift with you? Can I share that and with you? Yeah, and yeah. suddenly we, ha I said it in the podcast in our origin story that um, we're actually getting players Players. We're getting athletes that are, are sleeping together, dating now, um, which has its pros and cons, I believe, more pros than cons. But it shows that they're actually integrating and, and building a bit of a culture and, and they hang out for coffee. They hang out and play FIFA oh, tournaments wow. here. They recover together. They're texting each other outside of the facility, catching up for drinks and stuff like that. And these are, these are people that would otherwise have never met or known each other. Um, and that's the culture we want to breed. And it is about having these commonalities around programming, but also knowing that the soccer player lifting with the rugby player, the soccer player also knows that my adductors are taken into account, my position is taken into account. I can see where my individual um, individualizations are. So to be clear, does that mean that every, like, so your A1 lift is trap bar deadlift, for instance? Does that mean that on a Monday everyone is trapped by deadlifting? Or what about people that's their first session of the week is the Tuesday? How does how does that Yep, so okay. so the, the so it'll be done off session one rather than Monday or Tuesday. So right. if yep. if if you fall into a field based program and let's assume in the field based program A one is a trap bar dead, <laughs> um, then you will trap bar dead for your first session. You as an individual might be tailored based on your managing coach to say, look, <clears throat> we know that they've, uh, they've, got, they've had two games on the weekend and it's in season, therefore they might change it to an elevated trap by dead. Yeah. Um, they might have a history of, of some sort of low back, in which case they might be edited again. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it is basically if you fall into the field-based program and it happens to be a trap by dead, then yes, everyone uh, will trap by dead unless they have been specifically modified accordingly. And there are certainly plenty of times where they, things are modified, mm. um, but ultimately, to keep within the system, it'll still be a big key lift, it'll still be lower body, like most likely a push, um, and it'll flow around the rack. So it's going to be something that'll flow well in our gym as well. I love that. Great. And then in terms of, so you have your five weekly system where you-, where you Yes, yeah, 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 periodization, yep. Um, are, they, are they athletes all, are they 
in their is everyone on their own schedule or are they all in on the same alignment as well how does that work yep 80 80 percent are on the same alignment 20 percent aren't so we yeah. we our facility as a whole um so to explain it we do a five-week periodization model um week one is our climatization week where they are deloaded so we deload at the beginning of the block um where they get upskilled on any new exercises that may be introduced into the program um and allows them to do it with a reduced volume so if they do get a little bit of doms from a new exercise it's not that major mm. um, um, and then we basically have week one is the acclimatization. We then go into week two accumulate accumulation where we build up volume. We then have week three and four, which are progressive intensification blocks where we look to, to hunt load. Um, and then week five is our realization where we uh, we repeat week three and attempt to try and add a little bit of load where we can. Um, that five week block, sorry, what was that? So, so that's awesome because that means that in that week five, around 80% of your people are chasing PBs in the same week. Like that's that's going to so, be a vibe in there, yeah. Exactly, it's where our, our bell gets rung a lot. We uh, yeah. we have a, we have a real good vibe with it. So it's it, it, we do that. So then, because on our week one, where we're deloading volume, I personally hate losing training to testing. I think mm. testing is quite valuable, but I also do love getting results within training mm. sessions. Mm. Um, but there are just some tests like isometric mid thigh pulls, um, counter movement jumps, and stuff where where you just kind of need to test it. You can't always have it in the program. Um, so every every five weeks we do test so on that week one which is that um, acclimatization week because their volume is less their session time is less so mm. it's quicker for them to get through their program which gives yeah, them that extra room. time to be able to test so um, we test everyone every five weeks and, and our philosophy That's is so it's, it's about the trend it's not about the the acute result um, we're about dirty science because mm. if if we wanted to be absolute pure science that we could That's we could impossible. publish it makes it impossible to test. So um, for us, there's going to you know, some might have slept poorly, some might be middle of season, some might be pre-season, offset. It doesn't matter. We test, and some people might be sick. We don't catch it up. There's nothing worse than trying to catch up testing. We have a week of testing, and then it's someone comes back the next. Oh, I was sick. Can I do my Nord board this week? No. If you miss it, you miss it, because otherwise you'll be testing someone every week. It just becomes mm -hmm. too hard. So week yeah. one. We, we tick off all the testing. Our sports scientist, Adam, gets on the gym Who's floor. Great. He grabs Pines. everything. Yeah, he's fantastic. What a find. Yes, that no, was very good. Very good. He found us, luckily. And, yeah, well, and thank God. Your magnets. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, and, and, and that's where, you know, parents and athletes really trust what we do because we show them the results mm. where they get they get a report every five weeks of where they're at. And, and sometimes they go down on things because they're fatigued. Or, but the, it's the trend that we look for. That okay. When they arrived to us, they had a squat jump of 20 centimetres and now they have 29 centimetres. Which is amazing. In between that. They've maybe come up, gone down, come up, but the trend is what we want to look at because we're we're a long term facility. We don't we don't bring athletes in for four week stints to make them better. We bring athletes in for twelve month contracts and, and we make them better. Yeah, I love it. Um, this is a shitty question, but I'm I'm going to ask it anyway. Yeah. If you had to just pick three tests, what do you reckon you would pick? Uh, three tests. <clears throat> I'd probably pick three tests. That's a great That's one. A, yeah. I like a three hop for distance. Um, mm -hmm. Would probably be one. I Three would then probably go, yeah. yep, let's, I'll make it even easier for myself. Let's assume we're not accounting for any lifting testing for 1RM, but I'd go an isometric mid-thigh pull for strength. Mm -hmm. I'd use a three hop for distance for some explosive measures. Um, and honestly, I would probably use a Nord board because of mm -hmm. my context, um, the amount of team sport athletes I deal with, hamstrings are, are number one. So mm -hmm. for me, that's a, it's a big influencer in my program. I love it. That's great. Um, next, I've got a few technical questions. Mm. Um, but the first one's sort of more political technical. Political? Here we go. How do you go – so how do you go with – there's interesting trends. Like, for instance, at the moment there's this trend where there's, there's people arguing that technique doesn't matter. Just lift it however you like. Uh, yeah. Lower back pain is just imaginary. <clears throat> it's no one's – mechanical back pain is impossible. Just do it and you'll be fine. Uh, and it's it, – to me, it's it's pretty careless. Um, how do you go, and it makes us sound like real sort of nerdy sticklers for technique, how do you go about breaking down something like that? Because that's a ridiculous idea. How do you deconstruct that? Exactly the same as every other ridiculous idea that exists in our industry, that, yeah. that people grab a pendulum and they swing it to one side because mm. it sells or they swing it to the other side. Um, mm. It's the same as, you know, back in the day that I remember, uh, without naming names, there's a number of coaches and a number of institutes out there that, that believed on um, certain 
uh, blood pressure cuff results with lower abdominal core control mm. on the floor before anyone could even do anything standing. So you had to be able to nail your lower abdominal wall before you were allowed to even grab a dowel to I, squat. I am um, so glad you brought that up because that was my pet. I remember I was I was right there at the same time as you, and there were and this was a bit of a checky thing. And I remember there was, there was a seminar by someone who'd been up at the AIS, very highly credentialed. And it was like, if you if someone, if someone were activating the rectus abdominis, they'd be like, oh, no, you're activating your rectus abdominis. That's terrible. It's global stability. I'm like, I'm pretty sure this system evolved as a team of muscles. The mm. idea that rectus abdominis was the devil, like that was a real thing. It was like they discovered transverse yeah. abdominis and it was the best thing yeah. ever. And it was bonkers. Yeah, um, it's, as I said, so that, that's the other extreme. Yeah. So um, mm. to be a very boring answer, I, I, I genuinely live in the middle and live in the grey. That um, You know, for our young LTAD athletes, you know, it's 14, 15, we, we program exercises that allow them to learn, allow them to, to educate their movement patterns. And mm. a lot of that is letting them play. So, for example, they're doing an arabesque and they look terrible. Honestly, for that, I don't care. I'll, mm. I'll, I'll give little cues here and there, but so, so what they round their back, they're not going to injure themselves doing that. It's, yeah. it's body weight. Just let them learn the pattern. Mm. If they're deadlifting and they're rounding their back poorly at the beginning and that's their solution, then that's an issue. But I think that's a programming issue because I've obviously accelerated it too quickly. Mm. But by the same token, I'm, if I'm working with a 22-year-old athlete that's you know, squatting a PB and they lose a bit of, bit of tension in their spine, of course, it's a one RM. That's what it's going to happen. So um, I think it's it's got to be educated um, risk assessment, like we do with everything. Um, and I, I firmly believe it's it's somewhere in the middle. I, I definitely don't think technique is the sole contributor to, to injury. It certainly, mm -hmm. is, it's it is multifactorial. Yeah. Definitely. But if it is a factor in a plethora of factors, it's still something I'm going to try and coach and correct. I'm not going to let someone just progress because someone told me that it's not technique. So mm -hmm. I personally think that the truth lies in the middle, um, which is very boring because people like to polarise left mm -hmm. and right. Um, but there's times where I'll be a stickler for technique um, when it's appropriate and there's times where I'll be a stickler for load when it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, and that for me, because I'm a big believer that load also influences things. I, d I don't want people to just have the most perfect technique 24 seven, because I don't believe you're going to be able to listen to the greatest stimulus. Mm. But at the same token, I think having really good movement patterning is going to help you lift more load in certain instances. It's, it's such a hard thing to convey because yeah, you're right. Like what you want is optimum technique, not perfect technique. You want the technique that can enable you to get the dose of the stimulus you need, mm. but keep everything safe and within kind of guardrails. Yeah, I, I agree. Hundred percent. Yep. Um, what's your favourite unilateral? What's your favourite squat pattern in terms of a, a unilateral squat pattern? What's your? What's do you have a go to that you love? Unilateral. Yeah, unilateral squat um, pattern. What, whatever I need to use at the time. Um, typically, mm. the squat patterns we use, uh, we use uh, rear foot elevated, we do pistols, um, we do step downs, we do step ups. Oh, I, I think step like heavy low box step ups are, are probably a really go to for mm. me coming out of a, of a team sport environment where it's limited range of motion. So it's low fatigue, but it's also a good way for us to, to really load heavy with, with athletes. Mm, I like it. Um, okay, next one. Uh, are rollouts really your favorite movement? <laughs> um, it's probably what I'm strongest at, so <laughs> I'll always always gravitate towards that. That's why I often get my coaches to write my programs because otherwise yeah. I'll I'll just do bench press uh, into rollouts every day. <laughs> <laughs> We've all got our favourites. Um, and look, I, I know um, yeah, you're probably running out of time, so I just got a couple couple more questions. Yeah. Um, I'm really curious to hear your take on the coach. I'm I'm pretty obsessed with the coachy part of coaching. I think as coaches, we often get a little over-focused on the prescription part of coaching. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And then yep. we don't actually do the, the create that sort of ignition within the athlete to really push hard and, and go. How do you talk to your team and your athletes about, about that type of thing? Um, so team being – yeah, so, so probably two questions there. Well, mm, probably. From a coach standpoint, I think um, – I, I, I really believe that, that being heavily focused on the X and O's is the evolution of a coach. And to be honest, I don't think I'd change that. I, I think um, the art of coaching and being able to, to have those soft skills, as people call it. I know Brett Bartholomew hates people calling it soft skills because they're not soft, but um, nonetheless, they are the, the, the more intuitive the skills, skills with people. Yeah, yeah um, is important. But I honestly think that, that 
I've sort of, again, see the pendulum swing where these coaches are, are really good at connecting with people mm. but, but don't know how to bloody program, don't, don't know how to actually <laughs> demonstrate and program, which, which is a whole other issue. So um, I, I think it's just a natural evolution of a coach. When you're young, you're 18, 19, you wanna, you, you're hungry to know your industry. You, you're hungry to know the X's and O's. Um, mm. And your experience will start to, to shape the way you interact with people. But it's so important to have that thread um, of coaching skill acquisition and understanding how to integrate and interact with people. And, you know, I've, I've said it in a couple of podcasts that the biggest realisation I had was, um, you know, at the Giants, I was talking to some of the boys and they were they were just blabbering on about The Bachelor or whatever it was at the time. Um, and they loved it. That's that's what they, they were talking about. And I'm sitting there going, you know what, like in this room, I'm the only one that actually cares at all about strength conditioning. And it's good because that's my job. But how, how do I then talk to these guys about, you know, Poliquin's chat on GVT and, and stuff like that? Well, they don't care. You know, they, they, will, they will have yeah. some interest at some stages in things and, and they see something on Instagram and they'll want to ask questions about that. But that's not true connection. That's, that's just topical conversation. Um, mm. So I, I realised pretty quickly that if you, if you want to truly connect with people, you, you actually don't talk about your industry. When the conversations mm. I have here, don't get me wrong, I'm asked my advice on things. I'll also give my opinion on things and, and in the coaching frame, we'll coach the hell out of people. But most of my conversations are the same as I have with my mates. You know, I talk mm. to them about their day. I talk about what they interest them. We, we have some banter. Uh, I take the piss out of them for different things and, and stuff like that. And um, male, female, young, old, it doesn't matter. It's, it's something right. that, um, that, that for me, it's, it's the way we are. And, and, you know, you ask any coach that works for me here, they know that, that I take what I do very seriously, but I certainly don't act seriously. Um, oh, yeah, and it's, like it's, and it, it is, and, and <laughs> exactly, or con the fruit, yeah, exactly. Well, and then ironically, <laughs> that kind of shows where we're at there. Um, but it's, it's, if I, if I was in an environment, um, where I had to be uh, a general, I had to be military in style. I certainly wouldn't wouldn't survive that way. And um, you know, one of my coaches in particular that was with us um, has taken another role and is a, is is coming back to us. Like is is one of the biggest things. Is he said that where he's working now is he, he was talking to a player, uh, ironically about the the rehab session that player had done, and the the senior coach at the time had a crack at him for talking on the gym floor, they should be lifting. Um, and for me, that's just absolute crock. Like, I mean, even in the professional setting, I used to banter with boys on the gym floor. That's, you know, on the bench press, that's where they used to be able to get away. Everything's so serious. Everything's so football orientated, depending on the sport you're in. And, um, the, the gym's a bit of an escape. That's where you can, you can still work hard and have fun. Um, mm. And I'm a massive believer in that. Um, and I think educating athletes, coaches, and teams that having fun, is having fun, working mm. hard is working hard, and there's no reason why you can't switch between the two. Yeah. There is no doubt immature athletes and immature coaches maybe can't balance that, and that would probably be the biggest education that I give to a lot of our coaches. Mm. Um, we have one coach in particular, Noel, who was an intern with us, fantastic people skills, connects with everyone, very boisterous, loud, and very energetic. Um, but because of that, he would then, when he would try and coach with a bit of seriousness, it was very hard to take it because he's always so boisterous. Yes, yeah. um, so it's something that we've worked on a lot with him and he's improved so much that he still has his personality and that, you don't want to take that away. But he can now shift between being serious with coaching but also still having fun and moving between. And it's a really important part that a coach needs to have to, to be able to pull someone up be direct, but then shift into still being a connected coach and, and having fun, especially in the private sector. We're a service. Um, in the professional setting, they're paid, paid millions of dollars and kind of they're meant to do what you tell them, but we all know that they certainly mm -hmm. don't. You still have to build connection for them to do it. Um, but in, in the private sector, um, you know, they're, they're, they're paying for a service and they, they expect to be held accountable, but they also they can choose to leave whenever they want. So you want to make sure you, you make an environment they don't want to leave. You're not their workplace. Yeah, well, exactly. Exactly. Yep. Now, last section because I know you're a very busy man, and uh, but I everyone's I, busy. <laughs> I can't. I can't uh, interview, uh, chat to you without asking about this. I am fascinated to see the way in which you have torn up and reinvented the rehab space. Like what you guys are doing to me is kind of the holy grail of of rehab, where you're actually bringing the the, the teams together, bringing the 
the physio and the strength coach and the sports med doctor and actually getting that genuine high performance environment in a private setting. Thank um, you, yeah. It's, yeah, it's great. It's, and it's like the results are going to be just off the chart. Like it's good now, but you wait in a couple of years. I think it's, it's huge. Um, something I've always thought about as being kind of, you know, the ultimate, the sort of utopian ideal. Mm. Uh, can you tell us about how you make that work? Because I've always been curious. I've always been saying, oh, this would be great, but I reckon it would be so much head, head butting. How have you made? Um, look, well, well, one, yeah, good staff hiring, but people that have a, a common a common goal. Um, but ultimately, the it's the way you frame it, and and the principle is we we sell a result, we don't sell the process. Even though you've got to love the process, mm. um, the the thing that's that's sort of broken with a, a typical physio model, and this is from an athletic standpoint. So remember, it's the uh, general GPs that just have a sore knee going to a physio to get a bit of treatment. Of course, that, that can help and can work. Mm. But for for athletes that are looking to return to their sport um, to be able to perform at an elite level, that have a long term injury. Them going to a physio for X amount of money for every session, where for them, they don't want to spend the money. So there's an incentive for them to actually go less and less because it gets more and more expensive. Um, then it's not the mentality we have because ultimately, as they, they, they graduate into more and more training, you want to keep on top of them and them actually working harder and harder before they go back into to play. Um, the, the, the mentality of them starting with physio where they have a handful of exercises and forget about everything else about their body and just focus on, let's say, the knee and they slowly get out of pain with the knee and then they're like, yes, I don't need to see the physio as much is a mentality that, that is not going to take you to a high performance level um, when you compare that to what happens in the pro sport. And that's that's what I, I took it from, is looking at pro sport. And myself and Carl said, we, we want to replicate our facility, not just from a performance model, but from a rehab model around professional sport. Um, the performance model came first because that was an easy one because you only required strength and conditioning coaches. Um, but the next part is how can we start to utilise our, our rehab space? And, and ultimately, that's where we, we brought on physios that agree that strength and conditioning and physiotherapy are one in the same. They're, they're meant to work together. Athletes are meant to be in that grey area where they go in between the two of them. And from a, a pure rehab standpoint, when someone comes to us and we put our logo on them, we put our brand on them and give them the tick of approval, it's not because they came in and got treated once or twice on the knee. If they've got an ACL, mm. well, you're either doing your ACL rehab or you're not. There's no in-between. So when someone mm. comes to us, that's a 12-month contract they sign with us for their ACL rehab, which that. is nine months. We get we are ideally, obviously, everyone's different, but we aim to get them back for nine months. Um, and then they spend three months in our performance program. So we can have regular physio catch-ups. We can have regular strength and conditioning. They come in, they pay you know, the, the per week amount, which gives them both the physio and the strength and conditioning and the recovery and mental skills and dietitian, um, everything in between where that actually gets them better. And there's people that come to us say, uh, today we had a, a guy come in with a shoulder Rico. That's a six month contract. That's our, that's our return to play. So we, we, so we sell them the result. Divvy it up in terms of you go, okay, six, a shoulder Rico, typically six months. Yep. Ankle, typically three months or whatever it might be. Like Spot on. So our, our shortest season. term is three months. We'll never do anything under three months. Yep. Um, we have three, six, nine, 12 based on, on the rehab. Most of our rehab programs will be six months um, mm -hmm. through to 12 months. And then all of that performance, so our non-rehab, that's a minimum 12 months. So if you if if, if we're going to put in the effort to you, we're, we're not going to do it for people that come in for a handful of weeks. Yeah, yeah that's a waste of time. Yeah. Uh, so if, I'm curious, hamstring, how, how long would you define that? Is that a, a six month? Or a month or for... it depends on the hamstring, grade one through grade three. We, we very rarely have someone that comes in for a grade one that joins a, a three month hamstring program mm -hmm. per se. We, we really don't deal with that. We, we have our performance athletes. That if they do a grade one, then they go and, and go into our modified group where they get treated by our physios and our physios will modify their programs. But yeah, our minimum is three months. So we'll term, normally deal with our, our two and three month, uh, two and three month, grade two and grade three hamstrings. Yeah. Um, but that three month contract will also involve them being back playing and just continuing their training to make sure that we're on top of them for their return. I love it. Great. Right. And do your physios do the internship as well? So are they as a cross, uh, is everyone learning through the same information? Yeah, so they, they certainly, they don't necessarily, so 
from our staff, a lot of our staff have come through our internship. That's where we've hired them from. Um, in our rehab space, we've had um, we've got Mon, who was an intern. She's now a physio, so she she got found through our intern program. And mm-hmm. um, one of our new physios, Will, has done our online uh, mentorship when we had that. So he actually knows a lot about what we do. Um, our other physios um, haven't come through the mentorship per se, um, but Justin, who's one of our physios, was one of our athletes. So he's actually Wait, been in our program. Him when we were up there, I think. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So he was actually within our our athlete program. Mm. I, I could have this wrong. I think for about eighteen months, twelve months prior, That's anyway. Right. So he was a touch footy player. So he's actually experienced all of our systems firsthand. Um, and then we have Will, who's one of our senior senior physios. He hasn't come through it, but he gets upskilled in all of our education things. So we have regular PD. Um, so all of our athletes are on all our athletes, all of our coaches, and all of our physios are all on the same page um, as far as our systems. That is our on boarding that's our education that's our upskilling um and they see it day in day out that's great um i love it uh and and what's the before we let you go what's the future hold what you obviously you'll be cooking up more stuff now because you've got uh, a, a bit of time to to do things uh what's what's the next 12 to 18 months look like uh honestly um well obviously with covid coming it, it took a bit of a hit for some of our stuff but a majority of what we're looking at doing um over the next 12 to 18 months is is our external education so mm. so putting ourselves out for we have a coach immersion program um which we've had to delay a couple gutted, of times because we were gonna yep. get off there for that yeah so hopefully we can just get this bloody lockdown stuff out of the way and move on with it um but that's going to be some great experience that we want to really push um mm. we're then looking at we've got a performance rehab certification we'll be looking to launch at the end of the year which will uh which will be looking to basically close the gap between graduates and end stage rehab teaching physios how to be better at end stage and teaching snc coaches and eps how to be better at early stage mm-hmm. um so there's actually some really strong systems and curriculum around proper rehab um so really excited about that um and then obviously the podcast side of things we're really really trying to get some good content out there for for the industry that that uh, hopefully people will enjoy and, and get a lot out of it's it's brilliant i love it uh, it's definitely compulsory listening at uh no, at appreciate it. in the space it's, it's really oh really thank good. you no i appreciate it yeah look, look you've been so generous with your time and your insights thanks for what you're doing for the industry uh we really appreciate it i think it's wonderful um where can people follow you and keep on track with what you're doing and what, uh, you're, doing, but- what you're doing Probably the simplest thing is both Athletes Authority and myself on Instagram. They're probably the easiest. So Athletes Authority is as it sounds, Athletes Authority. Um, and I am performance coach underscore Wilmot. Um, they're probably the two main things. I, I've got Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and stuff, but I, I, I rarely check it. So if you've messaged me on there, I apologize because <laughs> um, I, I rarely check those things. But Instagram's probably the easiest one that I tend to, right. tend to go to. Get around to people. Awesome. All exactly. Right. Well, he, thanks so much. And uh, Thank you so much, mate. Appreciate you your time. Love it. Right. Cheers. Cheers. See ya. Okay. Hope you enjoyed that episode. You'll find all the relevant show notes over at coreadvantage.com.au. Uh, also on the website, you can find more information about our uh, athletic development services, education, uh, short courses, and uh, everything else we're up to. So that's coreadvantage.com.au. Cheers, guys. See ya.